Hi, Jeff. Hey, Claire. I'm such a fan of like the bookshelf with the meaningful things on it as a backdrop. I need to make that happen in my own life. Well, truth be told, uh, my uh, office, this is my office, was a total catastrophe for like a year. Because I would come in here, I would do my work, and I'd leave, and I'd never pick up after myself because I'm like, it's it's go time, you right, know, and it's right, either right. I'm either going to clean uh, or I'm going to work, and and I was you know, and then it's like in between, uh, you know, times of work, I'm hanging out with the family, so it was like, well, I'm going to maximize this time, you know, um, and so finally I just got desperate and I texted a friend of mine who does some local assistant stuff, and I said, hey, like. My like I've got this big bookshelf. Like I had this. Not, it wasn't a bookshelf. It was like a big, giant, uh, um, like closet. Like this is like two hundred square feet, maybe less. And it was like half of it was filled with this cabinet mm -hmm. that was taking up so much space. And so I basically asked a, a friend of mine uh, if she'd be willing to redecorate my office and then just get rid of the crap. And I told her about this story about. Um, uh, somebody on my team, uh, 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 you know, I just had all these emails piling up yeah. and I, and I had like 8,000 emails in my inbox Nice. and, and I said, Good. wow, <laughs> said, yeah, right. And I said, if I just hand you this laptop mm -hmm. uh, on a Friday mm -hmm. and I, and I pay you for overtime over the weekend mm -hmm. and you just like, if you have time to do it, she's like, yeah, I have time to do it. And I asked her if she wanted to have some more work. She said, she said, yeah. And I said, and at the end of the weekend, you just hand me the lap laptop back and you know, all the emails are gone. Like, I just trust that they went someplace good. Yeah. And so at the end of the week, and she handed it back to me. She, she, she said, there's 35 emails in here that you need to respond to. I filed the rest. They are I archive them. You know, you, you need to respond to these 35 emails. I said, okay. And so when I asked somebody to sort of renovate the office, I said, I just, I just want to give you the keys on Friday. Yep. And I want to come back on Monday. I don't want to know where the papers are. I don't want to know where all the crap went to. I just want it gone. And I want to be able to come in and do my work in peace. And I came back to this wonderful thing that you see. So uh, all that to say. I mean, that's yeah. why I love working. Wow, just, I know, like, me I too. I don't even want to know what happened. <laughs> just make it better. Make it disappear like you're a cleaner for the mafia. I just want the problems to go away. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, okay, let me right. just, I think most folks watching this already know all about you, but I'm just going to go ahead and read this bio because that's you cool. know, like on my to-do list. So we'll just do it. <laughs> uh, Jeff Goins is the author of four books, including the national bestseller, The Art of Work. He is also a full-time blogger, speaker, and entrepreneur. Originally from Chicago, Jeff graduated from Illinois College and spent the next year on the road with a band. Not something everyone can say. After that, he moved to Nashville to chase a girl and spent the next seven years working at a nonprofit. He now writes and speaks for a living and runs an online business helping writers and creative entrepreneurs chase their dreams. Jeff's award-winning blog, GoinsWriter.com, has been visited by over four million people from all around the world. His work has been featured in places like The Washington Post, USA Today, Entrepreneur, Forbes, and Psychology Today. He and his wife, Ashley, live just outside of Nashville, Tennessee, with their two kids and, and dog. And you're in, a, you're in a new home, a relatively new home, right? Yeah, we just moved across town. We live in Franklin. We moved across town back in September. Sweet. All right, so I'd like to just kind of start out just asking you to give kind of, I don't know, a bit more flavor to those three short paragraphs I, I just yeah. read, right? I mean, how did you get to this place where... You were a nonprofit. You wanted to be a writer, and then now you're at this place where you can hand someone the keys to your office, where you do good work in, and you get paid to do that work, and then come back on Monday and then have it be better. And yeah, how did you get here? Yeah, well, first of all, it's really hard for me to hand over control of something like my office and go, "Look, fix this thing that I literally feel inept to fix." Mm -hmm. You know, like, or with, with shame, I hand my lap, laptop over to a team member and go, I should be more organized. I should be a better leader than this. I feel shame. But I'm actually learning to just own the fact that I'm not great at a lot of things. Hmm. Uh, but I think I'm good at you know, maybe one or two things. And I'm giving myself permission to do those things well. And it's not to say that we don't all have to do things that we don't want to do or don't feel particularly talented at, at certain seasons of life. And I'm doing some of those things now, but there are some things where I'm going, I don't, I, I'm not good at this. I, I'm learning to like myself, you know, even in spite of the things that I'm not good at and, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm willing to let go and be who I am. And so 
all that to say, my journey of becoming a writer um, was really that process of of that. It's becoming who you are, and and I'm I'm really into this right now. Uh, you, before we started this, we were talking about Parker Palmer. I love what he says in Let Your Life Speak. Before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I need to listen to my life telling me who I am. Mm-hmm. Now, Claire, you and I are planners. We like to-do lists. We like checking things off. We like making things happen, ambitious, driven. We've got a plan. I've always had dreams. I've always had things that I wanted to do with my life. Um, and it's like a very American thing to do. Um, and, and before we can do that, Palmer says, we need to listen to our life telling us who we are. And so at the end of my 20s, I felt anxious. I was starting to, to succeed in this nonprofit career. Success in the nonprofit world does not mean money, but it means status. It means responsibility. Every year I was getting promoted. I was a marketing director at this growing organization. I was helping us grow every year. We were doubling every year, and it was a lot of fun. It was exciting. I, I was doing something that I never thought I was good at, which was marketing. Hmm. And in the back of my mind, I always thought, wouldn't it be cool to be a writer? But I never, ever, ever, ever considered that a possibility. Like to me, that was like catching a unicorn. Hmm. So to say that I wanted to be a writer is, is uh, I mean, I wouldn't have even verbalized it because it was just such a ludicrous notion. Uh, but, at you know, sort of approaching my 30s, you know, I was 27, 28 years old, and I was thinking, okay, like I've done a little bit of a life, done a little bit of life. I'm supposed to be a grown up now. Why do I feel all this angst? Why do I feel like something's missing? And um, so I started going to conferences. I started reading books. I started um, talking to people, uh, inviting mentors into my life to just give me feedback. And uh, I started listening to my life, as Parker Palmer said. And um, what ended up happening was through a series of discoveries, which kind of culminated in this awakening for me, I realized I was supposed to be a writer. And all that really means is that for most of my life, in one form or another, I had been writing. Hmm. When I was a kid, I used to uh, I used to draw, and I would make Garfield comic strips. I would copy them from you know the newspaper, and then I would turn those into like comic books. And when I was a teenager, my dad taught me how to play guitar, and so I used to. I started a band, and I started to play. I started to write songs and play shows. And my favorite part in all of this was the creation process. It was making something seemingly out of nothing. And then in college, I was a religion and Spanish major. And I would get so stressed, and I didn't have my own computer, um, that I would escape during finals time when you're supposed to be studying. At like 1 o'clock in the morning, I'd leave my dorm room. I'd go to the 24-hour computer lab, and I would write. And I'd write these stories and I'd email them to myself because Dropbox didn't exist then. And uh, like that was my escape. I remember hearing Elizabeth Gilbert one time say that writing was her home. It was the place where she felt like herself. And, you know, home is not a place. It's like a state of being, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was true for me. Writing was my escape. But it was never the thing that I wanted. It was just the thing that was always there. Mm. And I think that's actually not a bad definition of calling. You know, the thing that you're supposed to do in some ways is the thing that's always been with you in some form or another. And I realized all these things that I'd been chasing in my 20s, I was a traveling musician for a while. I I became a marketing director. I did these different things. They all had this theme. They're very different, but they also had this theme, um, which was creativity. I liked um, telling stories. I liked doing new things. And I liked sharing my ideas with the world and, and watching them spread. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I was uh, at this uh, conference and I was talking to this guy and he asked me what my dream was. And I said, I don't know. And he said, oh, really? And he just met me. And he said, because I would have said that your dream was to be a writer. Yeah. I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I'd like to be a writer someday. Mm. He said, Jeff, you don't have to want to be a writer. You are a writer. Wow. You just need to write. Wow. And the next day, I got up. I started writing at 5 a.m. And I did that for an entire year. By the end of that year, I had this blog. I had a publisher that wanted to publish me. And uh, about a year after that, I had replaced my income and my wife's income. We both quit our jobs. I started this business and started writing books and helping writers and do all that other stuff you talked about in that lengthy bio. So let's talk more about this idea of kind of mentoring and I think this idea of sort of being an apprentice and um, 
going from apprentice to um, journeyman and to success ultimately. Yeah. Right. So I guess my question is you are here today in 2016 and you've amassed a lot of successes, um, you know, by any internal measure or external measure. Do you, how much of that do you attribute to hard work versus, I guess, luck versus people who kind of help you along the way? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's all of those things. I, I, I have trouble separating them. Mm -hmm. I am skeptical of the self-made man or woman story because it's mm -hmm. just not true. Mm -hmm. um, I think every story of success is really a story of community. And I, I know you're a reader, Claire. I am a voracious reader of biography. I love biographies. It's like the thing that I geek out on these days. So over the past several years, I've just read countless biographies of successful people in history, you know, uh, presidents, military leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, um, artists, you name it. And I've just tried to become a student of lives, you know, people's lives. And, and you know, for me, success is creating enduring work, you know? So uh, John Adams uh, was, uh, you know, a, a political leader who who created enduring work because we remember his name and in, in the country that he helped found is still here so far. So, like, that's a pretty good measure of success. And then, you know, Steve Jobs made stuff that's still here and will probably endure for a while. And same goes for Walt Disney and Mother Teresa. And so these are all different sort of, you know, versions of success. And I noticed this theme when I was reading all these biographies and, and the same thing happened when I started interviewing these people that I talked about for this, you know, book project that I did um, a couple of years ago is uh, when I was talking to these people, I realized, wait, 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 wait hang, hang on a second. Go back to that, that, that place where you, you told me about how your family kicked you out and you were all on your own. Mm -hmm. But then your aunt called you and she had you come into her, her house and then your roommate volunteered to, you know, uh, help you with childcare, um, you know, while you were a single mom and you were working on your dream, you know, late at night. Interesting. Tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. And I realized maybe people go, oh, yeah, like everybody has support networks. Um, sure. Great. But these are this is not we these are not stories that we tell about when we tell the tales of these people's success. We go, she did it on her own, you know, and it's never true. And so if you want to succeed, what I think you have to have at some point is you have to have a network. And that can sound really depressing to the person who is like living in Nebraska and is going, well, where's my network? I live in cornfields, right? Yeah. Or living in South America or something. Go, where's my network? Yeah. <laughs> But here's the thing, like you don't have that excuse because you're looking at your network right now. You're tuned into it. You're typing on it. And yeah, maybe maybe somebody in New York or L.A. or, or you know, wherever has access to relationships and opportunities that you don't have. That's not the point. The point is there is a community around you right now that you could be taking advantage of mm -hmm. that that you're not. Um, for a lot of people. They're just not. And so um, how much of my success do I attribute to the network, to the community? A lot of it. I mean, I, I guess I would say all of it, but it's not just a part, it's not just who you know. Like you also have to be good, you know? You also have to have stuff to offer. But without a network, no matter how talented you are, your work is not going to go very far. And so I really do think that community is essential. And what I love about this idea of accidental apprenticeship is it's not that, you know, we all have perfect families or, you know, like, I mean, I often look at people's, I look at your connections and I go, man, it would have been great to go to school with all these people, ended up doing all these amazing hmm. things. Um, and for years, I sort of sat with my, you know, uh, you know, my arms folded going, yeah, well, like, it must be nice to be Claire. It must be nice to be so-and-so. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I live in Nashville. I'm sitting on the couch, hoping to be a writer someday. Like, what if I just started reaching out to some of these people I want to learn from? What would happen if, if I just asked to meet with them, asked them for some advice? What would they say? So I started doing that. Most of them said yes. And uh, guess what? You know, not all of them lived here. I was, you know, I was Googling people's, you know, uh, phone numbers and looking up their emails and finding people on Twitter and just reaching out. And I realized people want to tell their stories. They want they want people to listen to them. And um, I think you can 
build a community for yourself. You can sort of um, create your own little team of mentors um, just by reaching out and trying to engage with the people that are willing to engage with you. And it's not going to be everybody, but there's somebody in your life around you that you have access to right now that I guarantee you could be learning more from. You could be inviting them into your life. You could be more involved in their life. And um, it's not about you know, I wish I had Claire's network. I wish I had Jeff's network. It's about responding to the opportunities that are available to you right now. I I really believe this, that, that there's there's a network out there that you can be a part of that's going to help you succeed. Paulo Coelho said this in The Alchemist. He said, the universe is conspiring for your success. And I, I believe that. Not everybody believes that. That sounds sort of woo-woo. But I believe that you have important work to share with the world. I believe that you need a community to do that. I believe that community is waiting for you. Maybe just like me, you've got to get off the couch and like make a few phone calls, send a few tweets, send a few emails and, and put yourself out there a little bit. So I really like this idea of a team of mentors. I'm not really yeah. sure if that's peer to peer mentoring or what that is, but tell me more about, I know you do, you were saying you do you have this year long program where you do, I don't know if you call it coaching or you call it, yeah, coaching, we call it which are kind group of coaching, group coaching. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Well, I guess maybe start with, what do you see the differences between coaching and mentoring? Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I think a, a mentor to me is somebody who comes along at a certain point in your life. I think of it as a guide, uh -huh. And I, I love looking at life like the hero's journey. You know, you think about the story of Star Wars. You got this guy, Luke, you know, uh, sitting on this desert planet going, my life sucks. I'm a farmer, you know, and he wants to go live some adventure. Obi-Wan Kenobi comes and says, hey, dude, come with me. We're going to go on an adventure. Here's a lightsaber. It'll come in handy. And like Obi-Wan is the guide who kind of sets the story into motion. Um, you know, you could say the same thing about like uh, uh, Dorothy, you know, going to the Wizard of Oz and, uh, you know, d d Toto's the guide, I guess, or, you know, uh, Glenda the Good or something is, um, you know, but the point is you're, you're in life, you're in the middle of your life. It feels kind of ordinary. Something happens. And then usually somebody comes on the scene and you go, who's that person? Maybe I could learn from them, you know? And I think real life is not quite so formulaic, but in real life, stuff happens, people show up on the scene, and you have an opportunity to let those people mentor you or not. Hmm. A mentor, I think, is, is a guide that comes into your life at a certain time, and often we do not recognize them. Hmm. We don't recognize them until they're gone. Um, now, if we recognize them, I, I think we learn more from them. A coach, to me, is a little bit more of a formal relationship, right? Like, I would never say somebody you know, accidentally coached me. A coach, I have to join a team. I have to sign up for a program. I am giving you explicit permission, mm -hmm. usually for a certain period of time mm -hmm. to make me better. Mm -hmm. I think both are good. Mm -hmm. Coaching is a little bit more formal, um, but I think everybody has access to mentors. The best way to find a mentor is not to go ask somebody to be your mentor. The best way to find a mentor is to recognize the people in your life who already are influencing you you just need to choose to be open to them. And so when, when, when somebody goes, will you be my mentor? That is the worst way to get a mentor. The best way to do it is to go, Claire, I like you. I think you're cool. Can I buy you coffee? Hmm. And you go, yeah, sure, whatever. And, and, and then I ask you a bunch of questions about your life and, you know, what it's like to, you know, work in tech and be a mom and, 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 and be a, you know, philanthropist and all these things. And, and, and then I go, Hey, that was really great. Love to do it again. You go, yeah, sure. Cool. Whatever. And before you know it, we're doing this every week. And I go, mm. wow, Claire's my mentor. And Claire's like, yeah, I guess I am. Uh, to me, that is the better way to get into these relationships than to formalize it with a title and, you know, like put pressure on it when maybe it's just not the best chemistry. And the truth is, you're going to have lots of, if you're doing this right, you're going to have lots of people in your life that you're, you're surrounding yourself with. And some of them come in for a season. Some of them are part of your life for years. And some of them, maybe it's just a random, you know, chance encounter. But that experience taught you something that set a bunch of other stuff into motion. I think all of that is valuable. In fact, I think you do this really well, Claire, uh, at least when um, you know, you were traveling through Nashville and you were traveling a lot more. Um, you'd come through a city, you'd 
tweet at people or you email some friends you say let's all get together and let's and and it seemed to me that your only agenda there was to bring people together and i love that you were trying to learn from them you were always trying to learn from the people around you that's what that means and some of those relationships are going to stick and some of them aren't and it's all okay but um, you're not going to have one mentor. It's probably not going to be formalized with the title. Your job is to keep finding people that you can learn from, keep choosing into that relationship, and make it easy for those people to show up. So when you reach a, a certain level of success, or even when you just reach a certain level of sort of mastery in a field, right, people start sort of coming out of the woodwork and asking to pick your brain, right? And we all, yeah. this is sort of a thing on the interwebs these days of, you know, people being annoyed at people asking to to pick their brain, right? right? How do you, as someone who gets that kind of request, probably in your inbox a ton, differentiate those types of requests from the types of requests from people that you think you really could sort of come alongside and guide in some way? Well, I have to remember how much of an idiot I used to be. Oh, that's and how much, interesting. <laughs> no, and that how, makes me think, yeah. Huh. And how much of an idiot I still kind of am, but you know, hopefully I'm, I'm losing levels of idiocy as, as I mature, okay. and thanks to my wife. Uh, who was I talking to? I was talking to my counselor, and he's like, he goes, how'd you, how'd you get healthy? You know, we were talking about how I grew up and some of the things that I experienced, and he goes, you know, how did you, you know, grow into the person that you are? And and I said, well, it's pretty impressive, I know. Uh you know, but I said, really, it's my wife, you know, she made me grow up. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know that I distinguish between like, I mean, I think anybody can spot like a hardcore sleazy taker, sure. you know, but like, how do you distinguish the person who's like, not going to take your advice versus the person who uh, is, I don't know, I, I don't try to do that. I try to make myself available and accessible to everyone. Uh, however, it's not unlimited access. And, and that to me is sort of the healthy boundary. Mm. So hmm. every Wednesday, anybody can have lunch with me, right? Really? I just, yeah. That's fascinating. So, yeah, so I just had lunch with, with, with somebody hmm. and uh, I was late you know, to our meeting because I was really engrossed in the conversation hmm. and I was like, this is amazing. You know, this is incredible. I love, you know, I love connecting with this person and hearing their story. Um, yeah, so I think everybody gets access to the front door but not everybody gets access to the living room or the kitchen or, you know, the, the bedroom. Uh, um, you know, so I mean, I think that that to me is how I manage that because I have approached people who are like, I'm sorry, dude, you got to pay to ring the doorbell. And I'm going, well, OK, I, I guess. Um, and I, I, I guess I get that. It's never worked. It's never felt right to me. So everybody gets to come and knock on my door. But like you don't get invited into my living room until you show some, you know, that you've demonstrated some, some trust. One of the things that I told these 13 people that I'm coaching right now, and they're paying me to coach them, um, is, uh, I am not going to give equal attention to each of you. Oh, that's fascinating. And I, and, and I but said, because you, shouldn't you? Yeah, maybe, I guess. I don't know. I get to make the rules. <laughs> Wait, this, tells, so, this is interesting. So everybody starts out at the same level, right? And and here's what I've told everybody. Okay, here's what I'm going to provide. Here's here's what you're guaranteed. You're going to we're going to have these coaching calls, we're going to have these in-person events. But if I see you going for it, I'm going to meet you there. Wow. Every, every like if you bring energy, I bring energy. So we end this call and I go, "Here's what you need to do next. Are you going to do that? Yeah, I'm going to do that." Okay. I do not take the next step until you do. Wow. So if the next person I talk to gets off the call and then goes and takes the next step, you better believe I'm not doing any of this no child left behind nonsense. Like hmm. I'm meeting them where they're at and they could go further than somebody else. And I learned this from okay. I learned this from one of my mentors. He said, go with the goers. Go with the, that's a great line. If, if, if they're going to go for it, you go for it. And that to me is, is great mentorship. So the best mentoring I ever received was from my, um, my former boss who mentored me for seven years and still mentors me today. Uh, very informal relationship uh, in terms of like- The mentoring like, side of it. Like, it's, like he was my boss and I realized I could learn some stuff from him. And so I said, hey, I'd like you to mentor me. He says, no, 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 no. Like, like just let's just get together once a week and I will, I will tell you whatever you want to know. I'll, you know, meet with you, you know, um, and, and we'll talk about whatever. 
but it's your job to schedule it. It's your job to set the agenda. It's your job to bring the questions. And I was, you know, I was an idiot. I didn't know what to do. So I, mm. I'd, I'd show up and he'd be telling me all this stuff. I go, uh-huh, uh-huh. He goes, are you writing this down? I go, um, he goes, you should write this down. And I go, okay. So I write it down. And then at the end he goes, what are you going to do with those notes? I go, uh, I'm, I'm going to save them. He goes, no, you're going to email me those notes to show me that you're going to email me those notes. So we have a paper trail of what you're going to do next. And then, and then in a week, I'm going to follow up with you on that. I said, oh, okay, I'm going to email you those notes. So he, I, he conditioned me to, to do this. And I was like, oh, I get it. You know, like mentoring is not the job of the mentor. It's the job of the mentee. Hmm. How well you get mentored is yeah. the job of the student, not the teacher. Right. Hmm. Um, so uh, when I reached out to our mutual friend, Michael Hyatt, and I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool to have him mentor me, right? Wouldn't it be cool to meet him? Um, I reached out to him. You know, he was kind enough to meet with me for uh, lunch uh, or for coffee. And after I took notes and afterwards I emailed him my notes. Wow. And, and I don't know if that impressed him or not. Um, but I realized that uh, the uh, – and my, and my first mentor, Seth, told me this. Follow up. You want to stand out from your peers, follow up. Most people are flakes. If you just follow up, follow through, keep doing it, you will do the thing that 80% of people will not do. So incidentally, I meet with people every Wednesday um, who want to pick my brain or talk about whatever. And these could be readers, strangers, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, and uh, when I meet with them, I tell them this story. Nine times out of time, I tell them the story. I go, so don't be like everybody else. Huh. I'm not like I'm not trying to be manipulative. I'm going look look like a, like I'm not trying to coerce you into sending me notes or whatever. But it, if like you're trying to get something out of this relationship, like I go with the goers, and so if you want this to go somewhere, it might be smart for you to take notes and then send me some notes of some things that you are going to apply because it lets me know that you took my advice to heart. I'm not offended if you don't. I'm not mad at you if, if I don't. I'm just telling you from experience, like, this is how this works. This is how you're going to take it seriously, and this is how I'm going to take you more seriously. I tell them what to do, Claire. I give them the script, yeah. and most people still don't do it. Still don't do it. Yeah, and I mean, so I, I think that's, that's, that's how it works. Um, I just want to end by, you know, there was this quote when Ken, Ken Blanchard and I were writing this book on mentoring. I was yeah. kind of inspired by different quotes on mentoring that I read around me. And you have a line in The Art of Work where you say, um, finding your calling will not happen without the aid and assistance of others, which is, you know, super simple. But it was, um, I think, really powerful to me at the time, maybe because it wasn't about finding your success, but it was kind of about finding your calling, which I think is interesting yeah. also how mentors can, can really guide you to that place. Hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's easy to succeed. You know, like I, I know some people might take issue with that, but it's relatively easier to succeed than it is to figure out what you were put on this earth to do. Mm -hmm. That's the hard thing. And I right. think more people are successful than find and do meaningful work. And so that's the thing that we all right. want to do. So we want to do something that matters. And yeah, of course, we we want to take care of ourselves and take care of our families and, you know, be able to eat and have a, a roof over our heads. But that's the thing that we all want is to discover something meaningful. And I think the wonderful thing about what you guys are doing is you don't find that on your own. It happens in the context of community yeah. and you better have some formal or informal mentors, coaches, guides, call them whatever you want. People who are further down the road than you are, who've tapped into something that you haven't quite tapped into that can speak into your life. Without that, you're not going to get there. I love it. Thank you so much for this, Jeff. Can you tell people what you're working on now and where to find you? And yeah. Yeah. Well, Wednesday lunchtime, Nashville. Come to Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> they only, you know, the caveat to that is, you know, there may be a line. You may have to wait. Um, uh, or you may not. Um, yeah. So I, uh, the, the book, The Art of Work, um, has done really well. It's continued to do well. And so I'm continuing to beat the, the drum on that. I had so much fun writing this book that I'm writing basically a follow-up to it, yeah. um, kind of like the next step of the process. So if The Art of Work is about finding out what you're meant to do, uh, the next book is about building a career hmm. around that and really making a living off of that. And I don't, I mean, I think you can, I think you can do both. I'm excited about it. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was great. Thanks, Claire. It's my pleasure. Thanks. Yeah.